This is the final sermon, or a two-part sermon now, this week and next week, in the series on fear. And it is the fear that I think is most important to talk about, and it's the fear that appropriately comes at the end of the discussion. That is the fear of divine retribution, or what we might think of as torturous hell, or God getting back at us for all that we've done. That fear, which some of you may think sounds odd, and it should sound odd, by the end of the sermon, I hope you feel like it sounds completely false, but that's, that's not going to change the fact that coming into right now, we are, many of us, afraid of it. We're afraid of God getting even with us for the wrongs we've done. Or some of us grew up thinking God would do worse than get even. That would, that would only be justice. He's going to do more than that. He'll exact revenge and torture us forever on a bed of hot coals. That's what many of us think, or we were taught to think. So today, talking about that, which is a pretty big deal, is in my place, an act of defending the goodness and character of God, which I take very seriously. I don't think God needs me to defend him. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, you just unlock the cage. You don't have to guard or you don't have to defend a lion. You just unlock his cage. Some catchy thing like that. But that's not the point. The point is my job is to speak from the pulpit on behalf of God and to share God's word. And the problem I deal with is the fact that most of what you believe about hell and judgment and punishment from God is not in God's word. It's make-believe, it's speculation, it's human creation. And so I want to defend the goodness of God. I'm not going to pretend that there aren't punishments for sin. We'll talk about that. But I am passionate about the character of God, so passionate that this could be a two-hour sermon. And instead, I'm going to try to make it two 35-minute sermons, something like that. But this is only part one. So there's stuff I want to say today, and I have to wait and say next week. So please come back next week for the rest of it. Uh, I just can't fit it all into one. But before we say anything, would you pray with me? God, we are approaching topics that are really important to a lot of people, and I think this could be one of the most important sermons I've ever preached, and so I pray that you would speak through me and around me if necessary, that your truth would be proclaimed, that your goodness might be known, that your love might be experienced, and that freedom in Christ might be felt by those who have been held captive to fear for far too long. May we see in Christ the living God who is compassionate and merciful. And may we reject the human concepts that lead us to fear and shame. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My favorite verse in all the Bible, and I don't say that lightly, I have a lot of favorite verses in the Bible, but this is my most favorite. It's 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. My favorite biblical author is John, the Apostle John. His gospel and his letters are my favorite books in the Bible, so I'm biased. But 1 John 4.18 is a verse that has singularly changed my life. It's changed my marriage, my parenting, my work, my relationships with friends. It's changed my relationship with God. And you've probably heard it before. There is no fear in love. That is 30 years of good counseling jammed into one little sentence. How many relationships could be healed and cured with just that statement? There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. And then people stop, and they don't read the next half of the verse. But it is equally important, because we don't really know what they mean by fear until John explains what he means by fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears, meaning anyone who's still afraid of punishment, has not been perfected in love. That is an indictment against many of us in this room. If you are still afraid of punishment, then God's love has not perfected you yet. But the goal of perfect love is to perfect, and to perfect you is to remove every ounce of fear which is rooted in the fear of punishment. And I know this isn't actually working in a lot of churches because I've been to walk-through-hell dramas. I remember as a kid we went to some something word on fire Pentecostal church or something like that, and they had a walk through hell. And there was a fake car crash and bloody teenagers wearing makeup. And then you went into the next room and it was judgment day. And then the next room they had stuff burning and red lights. And there was a Satan, in, like a guy dressed up like Lucifer, the demon Lucifer. And they were scaring us, even as a child, scaring us into heaven somehow. As if that's how you entice people into heaven is scare them, I guess literally scare the hell out of kids. Why? Why, is that? Why do people think that's okay? There are churches in this county that do that. Uh, we have someone here who told me a few minutes ago he played Satan more than once in one of those dramas. 
And I know, I know his heart, and he no longer feels good about that because he, he doesn't want to scare people. He, like me, we want to love people into the kingdom of God, not scare them. But why is it we are drawn to be scared? Like, why, do we, why do we pay to go to haunted houses and have people scare us? I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure there's good psychology behind that, but there is something in us. We are conditioned to want to be afraid, and you don't want to admit it, but you do. You want to be afraid of God. That's why some of you, after the sermon, and definitely after next week, just a forewarning, it gets even worse next week, because next week I'm going to talk about what Jesus said about hell and about heaven, and you're not going to like it because it's not what most of your grandparents told you about heaven and hell. It's what Jesus said, so I think it's better than what you were told, but we'll get to that next week. The problem is when you tell someone what they've always believed, even if it's a terrible thing, if you tell them that it's false, they will become vehemently opposed to it, and they'll fight you. People will fight to keep alive an idea that tortures them, even an idea that literally is about torturing them forever, like the hot fires of hell. People will fight to keep this stuff alive. I don't know why. I don't know why we think it's the most effective way to evangelize. I don't know why we think that's going to win people to Christ, but we do it. And preachers do it every Sunday. There are preachers all over the world who will get in a pulpit and just blast hellfire and brimstone. And there are people who will visit a church like ours and they'll never come back because they wanted me to step on their toes more, not ruffle their, or excuse me, ruffle their feathers more, not, not tell them all about the love of God. They want to hear the warnings of hell. They want to be scared because that's the only way they know they can do right, is if you scare them. Where does that come from? I, I really want to know. Where does that come from in the human psyche? I, I don't know, but I can tell you where your idea of hell comes from. It's a conglomerate view. It comes from Dante's Inferno, much later Milton's Paradise Lost. It comes from tapestries and murals that were created or painted all through the medieval period. It comes from an era of time when people were less and less educated in feudal systems. They didn't read, they didn't write, they just believed what they were told or what was presented in stained glass windows and painted on murals. And they were scared to give the little money they had to a corrupt governmental church that ruled over the land and to do what they were told or else they would be eaten by the demon Lucifer and burned forever on hot coals. These ideas developed through wicked human means to scare decent human people into doing what they were told. But over many more centuries, it became commonplace thought that that's just hell. That's what it is. And why wouldn't a good and benevolent and gracious God create a place to torture most of his children for all eternity? And no one ever seems to stop and think, that sounds crazy. You're telling me God is all good and all loving, but most of his kids are going to be tortured on hot coals forever, and that's what he wants? Raise your hand if you ever thought that sounds kind of crazy. Please. Some of you are like, I can't raise my hand. That's, you're going to think I'm a heretic. No, I think that's heresy. I think that sort of teaching is to, it is to blaspheme the goodness of God, to present a good God who would want to torture his children forever. That's ludicrous, and it's not what the Bible describes. That's a man-made creation. And it troubles me not just because of what it implies about God, which is the most important problem, but second to that, it creates a place of complicity where people feel it's okay to be mean and abusive. This kind of teaching results in all sorts of misogynistic abuse of spouses. It results in the abuse of children. It results in the abuse of employees by employers who threaten them. It results in entire governmental systems and corrupt governmental churches, which still exist in some countries, that demand people's allegiance and loyalty or else by threat of violence. And by scaring people and threatening violence and punishment, we control them, and we think that that control honors God somehow. Is that what Jesus looked like to you? When you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see God, that is God, by the way, in the flesh, is that what he looks like? Does he put together an army and threaten people to do what he says or else? It makes me angry, to be frank. It makes me angry because this is a God I love and a God who has loved me. And people talk about him like he's mean and vengeful and ruthless. And he's not. And they use this to justify all sorts of evil in the world. And then it gives us this false sense of God and this imaginary, angry, vengeful, wrathful God. 
I think maybe most clearly presented in Puritanism, which is what a lot of American religion is based on, that vengeful God of anger and wrath then is presented to people who have two options, either refuse that picture of God or submit to it in fear and do whatever you're told. And so has much of American Christianity followed. Either reject that God and say, that doesn't sound very good to me, which is what more and more and more young people are doing today, or take that God at face value and say, I guess that's just God. I got to do it. I don't want to burn forever. But what if there is a way of digging deeper and discovering a God who is true and biblical, who doesn't torture people, but loves all of his children? And we're not talking about a God who ignores evil, who lets violence go unpunished. We're talking about a God who is a good parent, who disciplines when needed, but ultimately to love and heal and help and restore. And I think that's the God we see in Jesus. In Scripture, that's what we find. Not this imaginary view of God who's almost waiting to kick you out of heaven, as if he doesn't really want you there, so as soon as you slip up, get out of here. Instead of that, we have a God in Christ who invites everyone to come and makes a way so that all can be saved, and who says explicitly, desires all to be saved. That's what Paul says in Timothy, 2 Timothy. So either there is a God who meant what he said and loves all of his children and wants them to be saved, or there's this other God we've made up that hates a lot of his children and wants to torture them. And you have to pick which one you believe in. You have to decide. And your children and grandchildren will be impacted by the one you select. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Lord of Scripture. And in Scripture, God gives punishments as discipline and correction to help the same way a good parent might spank or put a kid in timeout or do whatever they feel is best to help that child to be the best person that child can be. But I can tell you as a father, I don't want any of my three kids to be scared of me, and I certainly don't want to torture them forever. I want to help them, and sometimes that means yelling at them, and sometimes it means putting them in timeout, but only because I want to help them, only because I love them so much. And I'm I'm just a human father. Everything God does is intended to make us better. And if you really believe that, then why would you fear God's punishments? Consider Jesus. Again, we'll look at what Jesus taught next week, but just consider his life. He went into hellish situations, and he showed what heaven looks like. He did not come into the earth and bring the judgments of hell upon people. He came into hell and showed what heaven could be, what heaven will be. And he invited people in. And he even prayed, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus could see people were already in hell. They were already in hellish environments. And it was only going to get worse if they continued to reject God and his loving offer. And so Jesus made a way to fix it, not to send more people to hell. Does Jesus strike you as a scary figure in the Bible? We'll talk about him next week. I can't do this. I did this last service and I went way too long. He's not scary, okay? Jesus is not scary. The only scary thing he did was help poor people in the temple when they were being cheated, trying to make sacrifices. And he said, you're ripping people off. You've made this a den of thieves and robbers. It was supposed to be a house of prayer. That's the only time he seems scary. And even then he hurts no one and he helps the poor. Not very scary if you ask me. But you might ask, what if we take that away? What if we remove the scariness of God? What if we remove it? then there's no threat of being tortured in hell. If if that's taken out of the equation, where's the incentive to do good and to do right? And as Jesus often does, I'll ask you a better question instead of answering a stupid one. If I take that torturous hell away, the threat of God punishing you forever, if I take that away and you have no more incentive to trust or obey God, then my question is, do you even know love? And I would certainly say you don't love God. If your only incentive to serve God is the fear of burning forever, then you don't love him. We would say that about a marriage, about parents and their children, about employees. If you only did what you did for fear of being destroyed forever by not doing it, then there's no proof at all that you love the person that you are doing it for. This is just common sense, right? Am I saying anything that's blowing your mind right now? I think this is stuff you've all thought about on your own, but no one has the guts to say it out loud. It doesn't make sense. 
if the threat of punishment is the only reason you do good, then you don't really do good. You just avoid punishment. All I know is that you're afraid of burning forever. I don't know if you love God. I don't know if you love me or your other neighbors, which happen to be the two most important commandments. Fear cannot be the basis of a healthy relationship. Jesus knew that. And many of us who are married or have kids know that too. Fear cannot be the basis of a healthy relationship. Just to be clear, we're not taking away the reality of God's punishment. God does punish, but he's not practicing torture or retribution. We're reframing the punishments of God. He disciplines and corrects and makes right, just like a good parent. Good parents discipline. We know that but they don't abuse. We call that abuse because it's wrong. It's not good parenting. It's abuse to take your power. We know a, an adult can shake a little baby, but we don't do it because it's evil. But we say that's what God does. Takes little children who don't know any better and he just shakes them to death because they won't quit crying or screaming or pouting. What, what a sad and deranged view of a good God. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. He does discipline in ways that are appropriate and at times when necessary. But even that he does out of love because God is love. He can do no other. There is no hatred in God. There is no evil in God. But the Bible says God is not to be mocked. The Bible speaks so highly of justice. You can't read through the prophets of old and not see the value of justice. You oppress the poor. You take advantage of the needy. You disregard the needs of the widow and the orphan and God's coming for you because he cares about his children. But he isn't coming to torture you forever. He's coming to fix it and to make it right. He punishes sin because only the righteous can inherit God's kingdom. He has to purge all evil because if there's any evil left, then heaven wouldn't be heaven, would it? It would just be this again. So he's got to get rid of the evil, and that requires correction, but it's never torture, and it's never God trying to get even. The only time God talks about getting even is when he tells us not to do it because that's his job. Don't worry about it. God will take care of it. I think of the words found in Hebrews 12, 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful. I would argue this applies also to treatments. For the moment, medicines and treatments and therapies seem painful. If we think of sin not only as behavior, but as a sickness of the soul, this still applies. Nobody wants chemo treatments. No one wants to lose their hair and feel sick to their stomach every day but sometimes that's what it takes to fight off something worse. That's corrective behavior. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, meaning in the end, it's for your best. In the end, treating the greater illness, the greater sickness, punishing something that could lead to real death and suffering forever, the great irony is the only reason God punishes sin is because he doesn't want you to be tortured forever. And some of you think that he's just waiting to torture you forever. How crazy is that? I heard people say God hates sinners and that we should quit saying God hates sin. He doesn't hate the sinner because God hates sinners. No, you're wrong because you cannot hate sin and sinners. It's a logical fallacy. I either hate sin because of what it does to sinners or I hate sinners and therefore I appreciate sin because of what it does to them but I can't hate both. That's like saying I hate cancer and I hate cancer patients. You can't. You either hate one or the other for obvious reasons. You hate cancer because of what it does to cancer patients, or you hate cancer patients and you don't really care about cancer because you don't like those people anyway. Does that make sense? You nod with me. I need, you to, I need to know that you're with me right now. Okay. So God cannot hate sinners or else he wouldn't actually hate sin. Make sense? Okay. If you want to argue with me later, we can do it. But I will tell you, I, I'm working on a doctoral degree in the Bible, so I'd, I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've spent my entire adult life studying this. I've also spent my entire adult life unlearning how to be a selfish, bigoted jerk because this was the God I thought was God, and I've learned the hard way it's not. Now I'm a father. I can't help but see it. I don't want my kids to be scared of me. I don't want them to cower when I come into the room. I certainly don't want to torture them forever. I just want to help them. I want them to listen because I know what's best. And I'm not even perfect. Jesus talked about this. Matthew chapter 7, sneak peek for next week. He says, which one of you, 
if your son were to ask for bread, would give him a stone. Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a serpent. Meaning, if your kids need something, are you going to deny them what they need or give them something in exchange that's worse as punishment to them? They need bread. They need water. They need things to live. Are you going to deny them that and give them something as some cruel joke? And the implication is, no, of course not. No decent human would ever do that to their child. And then Jesus says, if you then who are evil, meaning you who only know imperfect love, if you can give good gifts to your children, how much more do you think God, who is perfect love, can give good gifts to his children? And you think that when you ask for bread, God gives you a stone and you call your preacher crying and say, why did God give me this cancer? Why did God take my spouse? Why did God do this? Why did God do that? And you attribute to God things that are not God's doing because you have believed for so long this lie that God wants to get you. Bad things happen. The good news of Jesus is not that God caused them. It's that God can fix them. It's that God is fixing them. And he can reverse every evil and make it good. That's the good news. I think of the story in Genesis of Joseph. Genesis 50, there's a famous verse. He's talking to his brothers and he says, you intended evil, but God used it for good. Before he says that, there's this amazing account of men who left their brother for dead. They went to kill him and decided at the last minute because the older brother said, let's not kill him. Let's sell him as a slave and just let God take care of it, okay? And so they made a decent call and they didn't murder their own brother. They just left him as good as dead as a slave. But of course, he ends up in Egypt. Joseph becomes second in command to Pharaoh. He's able to, through visions of God, save up for seven years during a famine for the whole nation and then feed not only the Egyptians, but surrounding peoples for the next seven years. Thousands and thousands and thousands of lives are saved. I don't really know how many, probably hundreds of thousands of people saved during this famine, all because of Joseph. God did that. And then Joseph's brothers, they come back, and they're angry, and they say, we we did the wrong thing. They're angry at themselves, just to be clear. They want to be scared. They think, we've done something terrible. This is God punishing us. We're going to starve to death. They don't even live in Egypt. They live outside of Egypt, but it's already gone that far, the famine. It's bad. Worst famine we know of in Egyptian history. And then they come to Pharaoh's house, and they encounter a man. They don't know it's their brother Joseph. They think he's a servant of Pharaoh, the second in command, this vice regent. And they go to him, and they say, we need food. Our family, our old father and our families, they're all starving. We're here representing our families. We need food. Please, can we have some food? They're begging, but they down, deep down they know they're not going to get it because this is what they deserve. They left their brother for dead, and they deserve to starve to death. And so they know this is what we get. This is only fair. That's the way God works. We did something wrong. God's going to get even. And then later, after some tests and trials and interesting things Joseph puts them through, he keeps their brother in prison for a while, and they have to go back to their father, and he's devastated. And then reluctantly, he sends them back when they really are about to starve to death. And you can read the story in the later chapters of Genesis. But there are trials. There are twists. There are turns. There's times of proving and testing. There's no doubt that there are some interesting things that happen. Enough things so that they really are convinced this is all for their destruction. They're going to get what they deserve. And then they show up again at Joseph's feet. And this time they learn that it's Joseph. And guess what they do? They become terrified. This is it. This is the reckoning. They're now face to face with the one they thought was dead. And now he's not only alive, he's their judge and their jury and their executioner. And they have to look him in the eye and ask for food. And they're devastated and they think, he's going to kill us. And Joseph hears, he hears them say, he's going to kill us. This is because of what we did. And it says Joseph had to go in the other room because he couldn't control himself from weeping. That's Jesus. Joseph is a type of Christ. He's pointing us to Jesus, who is a greater Joseph. Jesus, who sees us come before him, realizing that's the one we crucified, And now he's our judge. He's our jury. He's our executioner. And we're going to get what's coming to us. This is what we deserve after all the wrong we've done. And Jesus walks out and he weeps. And he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Joseph comes back in and he says, I don't want to hurt you. You're my family. I want to save you. 
He doesn't just feed them. He moves them into the land of Goshen, which is a land flowing with milk and honey, we might say, a place of blessing. He moves them into a space of blessing. He doesn't just keep them alive. He helps them flourish. If Joseph, a human being, could show that kind of forgiveness, if Joseph, an imperfect person, had that capacity to forgive and to bless his enemies, do you not think God in Christ has all the more? Do you not believe that Jesus is more gracious than Joseph? And yet here we stand, like the older brothers, thinking that this is what we get. This is what we deserve. I think God is brokenhearted that we would think of him that way. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The Apostle Paul says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, meaning before we repented, before we ever came to understand how bad we really were, before we did anything to make it right, he died for us. Christ died for us. That's a very famous verse. It's the root of much Calvinistic theology, which is all about salvation by grace through faith. No merit of humankind. And yet, Every five-point Calvinist I know who adheres to this theology, which I, I believe in this theology, I believe that we are saved by grace, but every person I know who fights for that still somewhere deep within them struggles to believe it's true, that God really could just love them even while they are his enemies, that he could somehow look past their faults and still care about them and want to forgive them and want to heal them and want to save them. We struggle to believe that's true. Maybe that's why Jesus said, love your neighbors as you love yourselves, because he knew we don't even love ourselves. And if we can't love us, we can't love our neighbors. And James would say, if you don't love your neighbor who's made in the image of God, then do you really know God at all? Do you love him? And so we come back to the root problem. We don't understand the love of God, and so we don't understand love. And John says, I can tell you about love, perfect love. It casts out the fear of punishment. But a lot of us still lack it. And what do we do with people who reject this love? Because that's a reality, isn't it? People can reject the love of God. And then there is punishment. There's discipline. There's corrective behavior. Like I said, God doesn't just let people off the hook. We're not pretending that hell isn't a reality, but we are reframing it. Hell isn't a place God made with hot coals to burn people. Hell is a space, a vacuum of God's love and grace. And it is only in inhabited by people who want to be there. As crazy as that sounds, there are people who will reject the love of God. And in that space of freedom, there has to be that vacuum of God's love. We call that hell. There are people who live in hell who have rejected the love of God. There are people who will die in that hellish place. That's why we pray for lost people, not because we think we could change God's mind and he'll finally let them in, but because we know they are obstinate and they need to let God in. We'll talk more about that next week too. But this place where people go when they reject the love of God, that place we call hell, whatever it is like, and Jesus only ever used metaphors to describe it, whatever it's like, I can tell you this, it's not meant for you to fear if you have accepted the love of God. Hell is not a threat for believers in Christ. It is a space inhabited by people who reject Christ. So if you're in this room and you care about Jesus, you love Jesus, you want to be with Jesus, you should not fear punishment. Because the only punishment would be for you if you don't want to be with Jesus. And even that punishment is corrective so that you would want to be with Jesus. So God can show you how stupid you are and how great he is. But that's not the way we think of hell. We think it's God hurting people for pleasure or something to make him feel powerful. It's just goofy. It doesn't make any sense. We'll get more into this next week, but I wonder sometimes... We, of course, are secure in the finished work of Christ. That's why we don't fear punishment. We know God has made a place for us in his kingdom. But for those he hasn't, those who resist, I sometimes wonder who could resist the infinite and perfect love of God forever? Who could possibly do that? And I don't have an answer. That's why we don't presume to know the judgments of God. We don't presume to know everything about the afterlife, its complexities and the, the way that time works in the world to come. That's not for us to understand and I think it would be safe to quit speculating. But we can know this. 
that whatever God's judgments look like, they are perfectly informed. Jesus told us that. In Matthew 10, 26, he told his friends, and this was an encouragement not to fear. He said, do not fear them, because I'm telling you, everything that's covered will be uncovered. Everything that's hidden will become revealed. Meaning there's nothing that God doesn't know. When he judges you, he knows everything, and he judges with mercy. He doesn't hurt. It doesn't give him pleasure to hurt you. It doesn't It doesn't bring God joy to watch people suffer. We'll see that again next week. But we need to understand that. God doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to heal you. He wants to help you. He wants to restore you. That's why we resist toxic forms of Christianity. We don't name preachers and name churches here, but we generally present an idea that we want you to stay away from. You don't have to stay at this church forever, but don't go to a church that presents a toxic Christianity, that tries to scare you instead of showing you the love of God and teaching you the truth of Scripture. We oppose that because I think it is spiritual abuse. And some of you are here with trauma because you have been spiritually abused. And that's why I'm trying to be delicate and yet serious with this sermon and next week because this is real stuff that has impacted many of your lives and your children and your grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren. Jesus says we don't have any reason to fear. The early church left plenty of room for Christians to consider how deep the goodness of God could go, to plumb those depths, which of course we cannot really. But it was much later that people began to confine God to those narrow boxes of revenge and retaliation. We started to put God in a box that looked very human and less divine, and we made God just like one of us but amplified. That's paganism to make a human being into God and pretend that's God. That's paganism. God isn't human. He's better. He's more merciful. He's kinder. He's he's more gracious, more patient. He's good. The early church left room for that, but over the centuries, we've grown accustomed to this false imaginary view of God that is so toxic. In the second century, Clement of Alexandria wrote that if God is good and if God is able, do you believe those two things? God is good and God is powerful. He's able. Okay then God will restore even his enemies. Meaning God can't lose. Martin Luther questioned that at one point. He questioned what it would look like for God to have a few select people in heaven and Satan to win and have all the rest of them in his kingdom of hell. And that would make God seem to be the loser, wouldn't it? You think about that. Only decades later, Origen wrote these words about a human soul in opposition to God. Quote, its end won't be destruction, but ceasing to be an enemy, end quote. Meaning, of course, this was in the earlier church, but some of the earliest lead thinkers of the church and greatest preachers and bishops of the early churches agreed almost unanimously that the greatest form of God's victory would be not to defeat his enemies, but to convert them into his friends. And wouldn't you agree that that is a greater sort of victory than than just cutting them down in cold blood, but rather to convert them into your friends? to bring them onto your team, to increase your army and make you seem more glorious. I agree. I think that's a better victory, and surely God will have the greatest of victories. And so they left room for us to think about that. It was much later that people started to push back and say, you can't leave that kind of room for grace. That's unrealistic. If you don't scare people, how are they going to do right? And Jesus sits back and says, if you scare them, how will I ever know they love me? really. Gregory of Nyssa, who's one of the great Cappadocian fathers, probably my favorite early church father, he's responsible for a lot of what we consider creedal Christianity or what we believe to be orthodox, true Christian belief, things like God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, things like the death and resurrection of Jesus and promise of his return, things that, that we consider just obvious marks of true Christian faith. He was responsible for writing a lot of that and composing it with others. Point being here, he one time wrote, and some others agreed with him, that God's love is so powerful, even Hasatan, or the accuser, not the demon Lucifer from a tapestry. We're talking about this angelic figure that's actually in the Bible named Hasatan, the accuser, that even this character in Scripture couldn't resist God's love forever, and even he would one day serve God and become faithful to him, that even he would become a friend of Yahweh. No one talks like that anymore. I bet you've never heard someone say that God is so powerful, so loving, that he could turn Satan into his friend. You never heard that. 
But don't you think that could be true? Isn't God that good? Isn't he that powerful? Why would we limit what he could do? And it's because we are conditioned to fear. How could these early church leaders, and I think the authors of the New Testament, especially the Apostle Paul, who was so hopeful that many and many, many more would be saved, how could they think this way about the enemies of God? Well, first of all, Paul was an enemy of God, so he knows firsthand that God loves him and loved him even when he was Saul of Tarsus. While yet an enemy to the cross, he said, why do you persecute me? Why don't you join my team, Paul? Paul's story is this story. So he gets it. So does John, and so does Peter, and James. They all get it, and the early church got it. At least they tried to understand it. But then over time, we've, we've calloused ourselves against this goodness. How could they hope? It's because they believed God was not just good, but absolutely good. That he was not just loving, but he was love perfected. He is perfect love. And if you believe that, it changes everything. Because if he is perfect love, then to be with him is to be without fear because perfect love drives out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And if you fear punishment, you haven't been perfected in love. Would you stand with me and we'll wrap this up. I wonder if you're convinced. I know it's only been 30, 35 minutes, something like that, but we'll have more next week. But, but at this point, I hope you're coming around to the idea that you're starting to think differently about God. Maybe you were already there. Maybe you're light years ahead of me in your understanding. But this was a long journey for me and I'm trying to do it in two Sundays with you. I know it's not that fast. It's going to take you time to think differently about God and about justice and about judgment and about heaven and hell and all the things we're talking about, but they are so important. They're so important. We don't presume to know the final judgments of God, but it's not what we're telling you. We're certainly not universalists. We don't think everybody just automatically goes to heaven. We believe in punishment for sin. We believe in justice and vindication of the righteous. We believe what the Bible teaches, but we don't believe in a God who tortures people, and we don't believe that God wants to hurt you. I don't believe that, and I don't think any of our leadership here believes that. I wonder if you still believe that. And if so, could that change for you? Could you begin to see God not as one who wants to hurt you or is waiting for you to slip up so he can throw you in the hot coals, but instead as one whose hot coals are meant as an act of kindness, one whose purging fire leaves beautiful things behind rather than what we often think of just burning up forever. We'll talk more about it next week. But I think what gives me solace is the story of Adam and Eve in the beginning. They're the archetypes of humanity. They're the pictures of humankind, male and female. He made them in his image. And what did they do? They disobeyed. They were naked. They were ashamed. They hid. And God locks paradise, says, eat the fruit of the tree of life and stay in hiding forevermore. Live in this shame forever. That's what I have for you. No. He unlocks the gates. He says, get out before you get trapped here like this forever. And then he sets out on the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, a story of redemption, of putting on human flesh, dwelling among us, dying at our hands and rising for our salvation. That's the story of Jesus. That's not a story of a scary God who wants to hurt you. That's a story of a God who has given everything to save you. Not so that you die, but so that you could really live. How do we not see that? How have we missed that? Our fear of this imagined God hinders us from being the people we're called to be and from doing the kingdom work we're called to do. That's why it matters. Because if you're afraid, you haven't been perfected by love, and that will hold you back. And we want to see you thrive for God and for his glory, the God who is blessed forever.